This is Land of Favela, Psalm 50. It's 23 verses, verse 1. A psalm by Asaph. The Mighty One, God, Yahweh, speaks and calls the earth from sunrise to sunset. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines out. Our God comes and does not keep silent. A fire devours before Him. It's very stormy around Him. He calls to the heavens above, to the earth, that He may judge His people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heaven shall declare His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. Selah. Hear my people, and I will speak, Israel, and I'll testify against you. I am God, your God. I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I have no need for a bull from your stall, nor male goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the livestock on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. The wild animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Will I eat the meat of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver you, and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, What right do you have to declare my statutes that you've taken my covenant on your lips, since you hate instruction and throw my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have participated with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil. Your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. You've done these things, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I'll rebuke you and accuse you in front of your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you into pieces and there be no one to deliver. Whoever offers the sacrifice of thanksgiving glorifies me and prepares his way so that I'll show God's salvation to him. Comment in verse 1. This is a psalm by the man Asaph. David appointed Asaph as one of the chief musicians, 1 Chronicles 16, 7. So this psalm comes from David's time. The ark was on Mount Zion in David's tabernacle at the time, and Asaph was one of the musicians that provided continual music there, according to the command of David. In verse 2, Zion is the perfection of beauty. Metropolitan areas today are smoggy. The landscape is asphalt, concrete, power lines. There's vehicular traffic and so on, not the stuff of beauty. But ancient Jerusalem must have been truly beautiful, at least from a distance. Up close, there would be dung and mire in the street, so not so beautiful up close. But from a distance, yes, as picturesque as a Renaissance painting situated on Mount Zion with its walls, towers, and buildings constructed from natural materials as a complement to the landscape, just a picture of beauty. And with the knowledge that Yahweh was present there with the ark, that sense of beauty would be tremendously enhanced. In verse 5, quote, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, end quote. In those days, God required animal sacrifice according to the law of Moses, and they complied. They sacrificed continually. And in verse 8, God says, I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices. So it wasn't that the sacrifices displeased him, but they didn't satisfy him either in verses 7 to 13. He said, I don't need your bulls and goats. I have plenty of animals at my own disposal. I own the cattle on a thousand hills, and it's not like I get hungry, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. So since he was okay with the sacrifices, what was the rebuke he mentioned in verse 7, the thing he said that he would testify against them? He never really said, except that in verse 14 he said, Offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High, rather than animal sacrifices every now and then. An attitude of thanksgiving and the paying of vows are more like true inner religion than outer religion. A vow in this context is a bargain with God or a promise to another person, such as a promise of payment, for example. God doesn't require us to bargain or barter with Him, but if anyone says to God, God, if you'll do such and such for me, I'll do such and such for you, it's a vow. Afterward, when God comes through on His part, the person who made the vow better come through on theirs because God takes vows seriously. When He makes a statement or promise, He means it. He'll come through, and He expects us to come through on our statements and promises. 
There was lots of Mosaic law on the subject of vows, such as Numbers 30, verse 2, quote, When a man vows a vow to Yahweh or swears an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth, end quote. And God's attitude toward vows follows very strongly in the New Testament to the point that Jesus said, in effect, don't make a vow at all. It'll only get you in trouble, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. So God said in this psalm, be thankful and pay your vows. Do what you say. Don't let there be any gap between what you say and what you do. Don't be a hypocrite, in other words. He hates that, Matthew 23, 13 to 36. Hypocrisy doesn't fly with him at all. Children don't respect a parent who says anything good or bad to them and doesn't come through on it. If a parent says, if you do such and such, I'll punish you, and the parent doesn't follow through on the punishment, the child learns that the parent doesn't mean what they say. Or if the parent says something positive, such as, we'll go fishing tomorrow, and he doesn't come through, same thing. The child loses respect for the parent's word and for the parent himself. So if we say and don't do, it doesn't fly with the least to the greatest. When we're in good standing with God and man, we're being thankful and we're following through on what we say, then God will be to us, as he said in verse 15, quote, Call on me in the day of trouble, I'll deliver you, and you will honor me, end quote. We'll get results from God. In verse 17, God says the wicked throw the word of God behind them. They ignore what he says. The law of Moses said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Deuteronomy 8.3. Jesus quoted it, Matthew 4.4. 4. We can't live by the word of God if we don't know it, so we're to know it and do it. That's much more profitable than any type of sacrifice. Something jumps out at your narrator in verse 20 that God rebukes anyone who would slander his mother's son. So we should be very careful what we say about our relatives. Being their relative doesn't give us license to criticize them. On the contrary, there's a heightened responsibility to be true to them. In verse 21, God says to the wicked, you thought that I was just like you, end quote. The wicked project their own morals on God. They figure God is just like them, that since moral corruption doesn't bother them, it doesn't bother God either. God will respond to that by tearing them in pieces in verse 22. On the other hand, in the next verse, the person who gives him thanksgiving is preparing the way for God to show him his salvation. That's the end of Psalm 50. Psalm 51 is next, but that won't be until we put out the next installment of the Psalms, Psalms 51 to 75, Lord willing. In the meantime, we have over half the Bible recorded with comments, so please check our podcast for that. You can find us at the Land of Havilah channel on your podcast app, and we have a channel by the same name on YouTube. And we have our own website at landofhavila.net.